Praise the Lord. We stand up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have today once again, a Bible study. And we thank you because you reveal yourself to us over and over. And tonight again, you want to reveal yourself to us. And Lord, we pray the revelation you give us today will make a great, definite impact in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that our relationships will be better, will be richer, will be more Christian. Oh, Lord, we pray that the relationship we ought to have, husband and wife and wife and husband, students and teachers and teachers and students and pastor and members and members and pastors and employers and employees, employees with employers, Lord, that our relationship become better and richer and deeper according to your word in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, the grace to reveal that there is something in salvation. The grace to reveal there is something, a deep experience in sanctification. The grace to make sure that Christ in us is revealed to the world around us. So grant unto us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as we are preparing for our retreat. We we'll pray, Lord, as your people come, you'll bring everyone without any hurt, any harm in Jesus' name. And we we'll pray as we congregate together in all the various locations of the retreats, you'll bless your people mightily in Jesus' name. And we're asking, oh Lord, that it will be a rich experience for everyone. You'll make a great, great, great impact in everyone in Jesus' name. Divide and open the pages of scriptures to us today. Give us of this heavenly bread that we may feed. And then we become wiser and richer, greater in the word of God in Jesus' name. Bless your people today as we study together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're coming back to our studies in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. We've gone through chapter 5 already, and we've gone through chapter 6. We're now at the beginning of chapter 7. We've already had two studies in chapter 7 already. Open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. Judge not that she be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, it shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will you say, or will thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. What I've read to you are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you listen to different people at different times, either in normal conversation or in the communication of the teaching of the word of God, you'll find that people misunderstand, misinterpret, and misapply these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They take those words in isolation, judge not, that she be not judged. And we've already covered two studies there. You understand. If there was any time, we ought to rightly divide the word of truth. And show ourselves to be approved unto God. What men that need us not to be ashamed. And rightly dividing that word of truth, it is now. If there is any passage of scripture that we need to actually look and analyze and interpret and compare scripture with scripture. And understand, what does Christ mean? What does he say? And how do we apply that? This is a passage of scripture we should actually look into very critically. Comparing scriptures with scriptures. Knowing the truth will set us free from error. And will set us free from the consequences of falsehood. To know the truth requires diligent study. You cannot just pass over the verses and just read at random 
and just think you understand and you cannot just take it in isolation and say yes i understand what that means you must look at the scriptures and study intently and then you must have such diligent study so that you'll be set apart and distinguished apart from many other people that corrupt the word of god in sincerity as faithful children of god as faithful loyal servants of the master in the sight of God, you'll be able to speak in Christ according to the word that he has revealed. As we look at the scriptures, we find that many, many people corrupt the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Even in the New Testament times, at the time of Paul the Apostle, there were many, many people. They read the scriptures, they turned it upside down. They misinterpreted the scriptures. In their own personal lives, they didn't properly apply. They misapplied the word of God. Even in the New Testament times, there were people that corrupted the word of God. And they were not a few because it says we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But it says, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. These verses are often abused and often misused by those who think it is wrong under any circumstances to ever pass an unfavorable judgment on the sinful conduct of the evil character of others. You know, there are some people that, you know, they are so, they're so weak in character. And they're so weak in conviction. They almost have no conviction. Whatever anybody does is acceptable. And whatever goes on in society is acceptable. And you know that evil doers, they can be oppressive and cruel. And they can be wicked and violent. And people who do not like violence, who want the preservation of their lives above the preservation of the truth. They say, I don't care whether the truth is trampled on the feet on the street. All I care for is the protection of my life. And because of that inordinate affection for themselves, and for, because of that overemphasis on personal peace, and personal protection, and personal pleasure, running away from pain, the pain and the agony of being able to correct the people around you and the pain of their reaction, because of that, they just go to sleep and they say, don't talk to anybody, don't correct anybody. After all, Jesus said, judge not, that she be not judged. But you know those uh, people that are like that, they don't have any backbone. They don't understand that if the people who know the truth, if you keep quiet, error will prevail. If you keep quiet and you don't emphasize the truth, because you're afraid of you're afraid of pressure, afraid of pain, afraid of the persecution of the evil doers, then you hand over the church and you hand over the world, the community unto evil doers. That's the reason why you need to prove all things and try the spirits in your relationship with the brethren. You need to understand what Jesus Christ taught. When your brother does something wrong, your sister does something wrong, a member of the church does something wrong, what did Jesus say? Keep quiet. Don't talk. Turn the other eye. Turn a blind eye, a deaf ear to what they do. Look at Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, what are the next words? Go and tell him. Tell him. Tell him. Don't be afraid. Go and tell him his fault. Between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou as gained thy brother. Man, in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Open your Bible. This is Bible study time. Luke chapter 17. We're looking at verse 3. Jesus said, take it yourselves. Hey, don't pet 
Protect yourself. Pamper yourself. Don't live such a delicate life. Don't, don't live such a protected life that you don't mix with the people outside and then you're afraid to even ever talk to anybody because you're afraid of going through the fire and the flame and the flood. And then you do not want anything to do with anybody. If they wrong me, good luck to them. If they wrong God, good luck to them. If they do evil, good luck to them. And then you hide behind those words, judge not. That's misinterpretation, misapplication of the word of God. In Luke chapter 17, verse 3, take it yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, don't get tired. Keep on telling him. And keep on correcting him. And keep on rebuking him. You know, if, if you have persistence in the correction, a change will come. And then Jesus said, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt Forgive him. In fact, the prophets of old were told that whenever they saw evil being perpetrated in the land, they were not to go into their cocoon or go into their chambers and then hide their heads in the dust in the sand as if they couldn't see. They were told that they must cry out and cry aloud. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading from verse 1. Cry aloud, spear not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression. Do you see that? I want to just keep quiet and say, well, judge not, that ye be not judged. Be quiet and live a peaceful life. You want to have a peaceful life in the midst of error, in the midst of sin, in the midst of evil. What kind of life is that? That's the reason God raised us up. As members of the body of Christ, as ministers in the church of the living God, cry aloud, spear not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show the people of God their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sin. In fact, we're told that if you don't do it, God will require the blood of those who perish from your hand. In Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 17, son of man. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman. And a watchman must watch. A watchman must have bright, sharp sight to see. And when you see that things are wrong, it is to keep quiet, judge not, and be not judged, so that you be not judged. He said, speak out, and give them warning from me. In fact, the Lord told Ezekiel, he said, you know the kinds of people I'm sending you to. I'm coming back to Ezekiel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6, and thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though they be briars and thorns be with thee. Those are dangerous people, briars and thorns. And it says, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. That's terrible, that's dangerous, scorpions. And it says, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Have you seen all that God said about the house of Israel? Briars, sons, scorpions, rebellious house. Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. You know what people say, what's the point of talking they will not hear? It was the point of, you know, rebuking, they will not listen. What's the point of correcting anybody or trying to counsel anyone? It's not going to pay, it's not going to work because nobody wants to listen to correction. It says all the same, speak out. 
And then it, it tells Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 When I say unto the wicked Thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will i require at thine hand you know what the lord is saying the lord is saying that if you run away from temporary pain the pain of a moment that he is because of the reaction of the person you are trying to correct and then you allow that person to perish and go into eternal punishment. You are trying to avoid temporary pain so that they will not oppose you. They will not react negatively to you. And then because you keep quiet to send them to eternal hell fire, eternal punishment, you must be a wicked man. That's why the Lord said, I will require their blood in your hand. Yet if thou want the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. You see, once again, all the teaching, all the counseling, all the instruction, all the warning, all the rebuke, all the reproof, they don't change what's the point. The point is this, in that verse 19, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You'll deliver your soul. It does good for you to deliver your soul. You must talk. And you must make sure that you do it scripturally. In verse 20, it says again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man, and the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because his one, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. You see what the Lord is telling us then? The Lord is saying, we well, must not misinterpret the scripture and say, well, uh, the Lord said, judge not, that she be not judged. It's more than that. Read and study everything that the Lord had said and then interpret and apply the scriptures aright. In First Timothy chapter 5 verse 20, First Timothy chapter 5 verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. You know, if you are into too much of psychology, you are not going to make a good pastor, a good leader, a good teacher, a good preacher. In psychology, they say, let the people save their face or faces. Don't ever talk to anybody about something he has done wrong publicly. Call them privately. I didn't tell them in the private without anybody knowing what you're doing and in the mildest way. Then you tell them, well, what do you think? Do you think this is right? Don't you think we should have done it this way? And then once you do that, you shut the door before you ever talk to anybody to correct them. And then you correct them in the mildest way possible. And then when you're out of that office, don't ever open your mouth to let anybody know what went on in the office. That's psychology that's not bible the bible says them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear in fact uh, if they do something scandalous that will uh, make uh, you know a rotten egg to kind of destroy all the other eggs you might even have to go a step further in first corinthians chapter 5 First Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And so as we go through the scriptures, we see that we have to balance up everything so that we don't just brainwash ourselves or put the blanket over our eyes and act as if we're not seeing anything anymore. The Lord wants us to balance up and he wants us to make sure that we divide the word of truth, divide that word aright. 
and apply it appropriately. We're looking at the study tonight. The, the outline is your hand. Transparent holiness before profitable ministry. The ministry of touching other people, teaching other people, training other people, transforming the lives of other people. If we're going to have that effective ministry of helping other people to become better in life, more spiritual in life, and deep and rich in the things of the Lord, the Lord is telling us that we ourselves, we must become transparently righteous, transparently holy, before we can have a good positive impact on the lives of other people. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, presumptuous reformers, thoughtless of their own behavior. And the Lord said that will not be right. That we are just presumptuous, wanting to reform other people, and our own lives are not reformed. He says, no, you must Take away the beam in your own eyes before you can touch other people, help other people to take away the moat in their eyes. And then number two, personal righteousness before teaching the brethren. That's normal. You need charity begins at home. And righteousness must begin with the reformer. You must be able to first of all turn around, have repentance, genuine salvation, and then observable, noticeable righteousness in your life. Before you can then talk to other people how they will become better in their own relationship with God or their relationship with other people. Point number three, proper remedy. For transforming the believers. The proper remedy for transforming the believers. We come to number one. Presumptuous reformers. Thoughtless of their own behavior. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 3 and 4. Here are the words of Jesus Christ once again. Why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye? But... Considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And the Lord is uh, making use of those pictorial kind of languages. So that we'll be able to understand what some hypocrites do. He said, there is a beam in our own eye. A beam is like timber. A squared kind of timber. And it's a large piece of wood in our own eye. When you think about that, a beam in the eye, that blocks out your own vision. You cannot see well. You do not see your heart. You do not see your life. You do not see your shortcoming. You do not see your fault. You do not see your sin. You do not see your iniquity. You do not see the anger and the wrath of God hanging on your head. There is a beam in your eye. And then out of the little sight of vision that remains you're looking intently at the face of another person and trying to see the splinter a little particle and trying to see the minute particle in his own eye and then you are more concerned about the little moat the little splinter and the little particle in your brother's eye and while you are condemning and criticizing and cutting down your neighbor because of the little fault they have behold a damnable sin damning sin that damns the soul and sends the soul to hell that damning sin is in your life like a beam that is shooting out that's what the lord is saying the Lord is saying then that it will be the height of hypocrisy to concentrate on the minor offenses of other people while you overlook your own great soul damning sins. Such people seem to see the modes of shortcoming in other people's lives, yet they do not even perceive 
They seem not to be conscious of their own glaring sins. Everybody sees their beams of great sins, but they fail to consider, they fail to perceive what great iniquity, sin, transgression remains in them. These self-appointed reformers that nobody has appointed, but they make themselves, they are the self-appointed reformers in society. Their visions are already impaired, and they do not see clearly because of the beam in their eyes eyes and they will not be able to help anyone if you're going to be able to help you must have clear sight a clear mind a pure mind if you're worried about you know what other people are doing wrong make sure that your life is all right false our lord condemns the habit of rashly thoughtlessly judging and criticizing other people he forbids the attitude of magnifying the minor faults of others making the worst of others while we excuse our own faults infirmities sins and iniquities those who carry the beams of sin in their eyes all such people who have not repented of their own iniquity and sin who are under the guilt and the dominion of great sins though they are not aware of the seriousness of their case they are disqualified and they cannot lead others to repentance or righteousness it is strange that a person can be in such a sinful miserable condition and not be aware of it it's more strange that a man will have a beam in his own eye that a man whose spiritual perception and understanding is almost totally nil, totally gone, will be passionately concerned about all the spiritual sight, ambition. Personal restoration to righteousness and holiness is necessary before we can engage ourselves in the ministry of helping others correcting others transforming others perfecting others we're told in luke a similar passage to what we have read in matthew luke chapter 6 verse 41 and verse 42 and why beholdest thou the mold why are you even looking at the mold why are you even concerned about the little faults and the little shortcoming of the other man or the other woman? When you have such a great sin hanging on you, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not, perceivest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, brother, let me pull out the mold that is in the own eye. Do you think it's going to allow you? He sees a beam shooting out of your own eyes. And then you say, can I put the mold out of your eye? How do you feel? You go to an optician. Those are the people that you know recommend uh, reading glass or the glass for you to see far to be able to drive. They recommend glasses for other people. And then when you got into his uh, office and you saw that you know he could barely see and he was looking for something and he couldn't see that thing. And then he called the secretary and said, Secretary, where is such and such? And secretary came and said, Ah, Papa look at it now and oh i didn't see that and then you are standing before that optician and he wants to recommend glasses for you will you stay no you run out this man is almost blind i'm not going to allow him to put his instruments on my face in my eye he'll make me blind like himself if you're going to help other people to improve their vision and you want them to improve on their righteousness and to be able to see clearly enlightened in the eyes of their mind then you yourself must be able to see clearly you remove the beam out of your eye then you'll be able to help the other fellow to get the moat out of their eyes you say brother let me put out the moat that is in thine eye when thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye thou hypocrite cast out force the beam out of thine own eye and then 
do you see the balance here? It doesn't say you must not correct them. It doesn't say you must not remove the mold in his eyes. It doesn't say you will say no, it doesn't matter. He only has a mold. He only has a splinter. He only has a little particle. And it doesn't matter. No, it matters. It matters. But what the Lord is saying is, don't attend to help him until you yourself, you receive help. Don't attempt to remove the mold. You remove it eventually. It must be removed. Because there's no little sin. Any little sin will damn the soul in hell. We cannot excuse the sin. Whatever sin it is, it's a little mold. A little splinter. A little particle. We cannot excuse it. But take care of yourself first. And remove the beam out of thine own eye. And then it says then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. And you see the people that, you know, they are so intent to correct other people. They're too much in a hurry to correct other people. And they themselves have not corrected themselves. And look at uh, Psalm 50. In Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 16. Psalm 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked God says, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? You understand that the wicked is the one having the beam in his own eyes. He has great sin of wickedness in his life. And yet he wants to declare the statutes of the Lord. The righteous standard of the Lord. He wants to declare the holy standard of the lord and the lord said what have you to do to take my statutes my law my commandments in your mouth and then he says or oh, that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth seeing thou hatest instruction thou hatest instruction my brother you hate correction how can you give correction to other people you are not teachable how can you teach other people you hate transformation if anybody says my brother look at this why are you doing you hate that and if you hate correction how can you give to other people what you will not accept that's what the lord is saying if you know that you yourself you are so rigid and you are opposed to correction and you're opposed to restoration and transformation. And when somebody tries to correct you, it goes the wrong direction in your mind. Brings hatred in your mind. And your wickedness will rise up like a volcano. Then how can you at that same time in that condition, with that attitude, with that disposition, with not beams in your eyes, how can you go and give other people correction to clean up their lives when you are not willing for your life to be cleansed? That's what the Lord is saying. That if you are going to be a teacher, you must be teachable yourself. If you're going to be a person that wants other people to be perfect, you must be going the way of perfection yourself. If you're going to help other people to clean up, you must go to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb and be cleansed up first. But you know, correction goes the wrong direction in your heart. And then you're trying to correct other people, it will not work. And it will not be blessed of God and it's not profitable for you or for anybody. The Lord tells us very clearly here in verse 17. Seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. When I saw it, say, see it. Then thou consentest with him, and as being partaker with the adulterers. Look at somebody trying to preach. It's a friend, a companion of adulterers. Look at somebody trying to correct the lives of other people, trying to take the moat out of their eyes. It's a companion of thieves. And the Lord is saying, how can you? This is contradictory. In your personal life, you engage in stealing. And then you are telling other people, don't steal. In your personal life, you are a friend, a partner in fellowship with those who are committing adultery. And then in public now, you come and say, don't commit adultery. Adultery. That's hypocrisy. And the Lord is saying, Thou hypocrite. First, pull out the beam.
beam out of your eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to pull out the mold, the splinter, the particle, the foreign objects in the life in the, in the eyes of the other person. It says in verse 19, thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue framest deceit. Thou seatest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done. And I kept silence. And thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Oh yes, we can correct other people, but let's make sure we correct ourselves first. Let's look at um, John chapter 8. Reading from verse 3. John chapter 8, verse 3. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taking adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. What do you think about these people? You will think they love righteousness. You will think that they actually wanted holiness to prevail in the kingdom. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Oh, they knew the scriptures. They knew what God did not want, but they never thought about it in their personal lives. All they did was to apply it to the lives of other people in the very strictest manner. They were not strict with themselves. They were strict about other people. I just begin to wonder, why are we so interested in other people to be free from sin and to go to heaven? When we ourselves were not going to heaven, why are we like that? If you love holiness so much and you know you are so much intent on other people being holy and righteous and pure and perfect and any little sin in their lives to frown at it, say, no, you cannot do that. You must be holy. You want them to get to heaven and then you are not ready to get to heaven yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. That they have a beam in their own eyes and the beam will hinder them from seeing the way that leads into the glory land. But then they want other people to see the way and to get to heaven but they aren't interested themselves in themselves getting to heaven. That's not right. That's not right. If you want other people to get to heaven, you cannot love them above yourself. You love your neighbor as yourself. If you want them to get to heaven, that's all right. But show the way, lead the way, and show the readiness and the willingness to get to heaven yourself. So these people said, we caught her in adultery. And then we were told, but in the middle of verse 6, but Jesus took them. And with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. I appreciate your desire for holiness, but any one of you that is holy, righteous, sinless, spotless, perfect, you can bend down and cast the first stone at her. And then, you know the story, they went away one by one. There were hidden sins in their lives, besetting sins in their lives, presumptuous sins in their lives. They never thought about their own personal sins, about the beam in their own eyes. All they thought about, look at this woman, look at this adulteress. And look at this dirty, immoral, corrupt, polluting woman. She shouldn't be in society. Keep the society clean, morally. And while they were thinking like that, they themselves were unclean, unrighteous, abominable in the sight of the Lord. The Lord says, leave other people. You know how many people are, you know, evangelism, evangelism, we're reaching out. You must be saved. Are you saved yourself? Are you born again? Is your life clean, righteous, and holy in the sight of the Lord? Before you can tell other people how to clean up, 
clean up yourself first. This one is terrible. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're looking at it from verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, we should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Can you imagine this? Here is Judas Iscariot. The plan to betray Jesus Christ because of his covetousness and then be able to gain 30 pieces of silver. That plan was already in his heart. It was hatching it already. He was going to go to the priests already and make the arrangement with them. And then here is another woman now doing something and spending her own money, spending her own resources, and she had brought this uh, precious ointment and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Judas has carried out at the mind, the mouth to even speak. Condemning that woman, the beam of unpardonable sin, unforgivable sin, was ready in his own eyes. And he was determined he was going to do that evil sin. After many, many warnings from Christ, he rejected the warnings of Christ. He rejected the admonition of Christ. He rejected even the sorrow, the agony of Christ. My soul is sorrowful unto death. And yet, somebody in that condition can find words to condemn another person. Why is this not ointment, this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And in verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and at the back and bear what was therein. Well, we're learning quite a lot. The Lord is telling us that we have no business, no ministry correcting other people, even in the mildest way, when our own lives are not free from non sin. In Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. That's what the Lord is telling us. We go about correcting other people, criticizing other people, trying to make other people live a more righteous life, and then we ourselves are not righteous. But we're sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Or thinkest thou this woman that judges them that do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God verse 21 in verse 21 thou therefore that teachest another teachest thou not thyself thou that teachest another pointing out my friend there's a moat in your eye have you seen it why don't you teach yourself and look at the mirror yourself first and see the beam out of your own eye. And it says, Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? You will discipline another person for doing wrong. Do you do the same wrong thing to you privately? You know, sometimes you wonder how strict some people are. It's wonderful to be strict. We should preach righteousness and holiness. 
But we have no right to discipline another person for doing wrong when privately we ourselves are doing those wrong things. You know, if you should see somebody in the church and they said he stole a hundred naira out of the offering bag, and you're making noise, great noise about that. Stand that person up in the midst of other workers. See this man stole a hundred naira. While if you, you know, go into the secret record of the man, he's stealing thousands and millions. Hypocrites. You have a beam in your own eye. And then you're trying to kill and destroy the one that has a moat. By all means, we need to correct the people if they steal even one naira. Useless amount of money. We need to correct them. But we must make sure before we correct them, we check up our own records. And we make sure there is no beam of set. The beam of adultery. And the beam of immoral, licentious living in our own lives before we talk about other people. In verse 22, thou that seest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Now that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. God, well, we know what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying it's wonderful to correct people. The church must be righteous. But before we do that, let's sweep the dead out of our own doorsteps before we can then help other people to make their doorsteps clean. We come to point number two personal righteousness. Before teaching the brethren. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're reading from verse 5. Matthew chapter 7 verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then... You know, clean up yourself is not the end. Yes, you must clean up yourself. Live a righteous life. Go back to Calvary and confess your sin and forsake your sin. And then be restored into right relationship with the Lord. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. But that's not the end. After that, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. I don't ever give an excuse and say, well, I cannot correct other people because I'll be beam in my eyes. No, you'll correct them, but settle yourself first. Clean up yourself first. Be restored first. You know, this does not excuse us and say, well, I have a lot of shortcomings in my life. And since I have a lot, a lot of shortcomings in my life, whatever people do in the church, I'll allow them to go scot-free. Because Jesus said, you must never try to pull out the moat out of the other people's eyes when there's a beam in your own eye. That's right, that's right. But he also said, cast out the beam. Don't allow it to stay. Confess the sin. Don't hide it. Clean up your life. Don't stay in that evil don't give an excuse. And then after you've cleaned up your life, and now you know the Spirit of God bearing witness in your heart that your life is according to the Word of God, then you will come to your brother and say, Brother, I had my own problem too, but I've gone to Calvary. I've settled that. Now we need to deal with this. And then you're able to cast out the moat in their eyes. We're looking at Psalm 51. Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse 7. In Psalm 51, reading from verse 7, here is how David prayed. Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. You know the problem he got into. He got into adultery and murder. And Nathan came and told him the story of a man having a moat in his eyes. He told him about a man that killed a little lamb. And he killed, not a lamb, not an animal, he killed the husband of the woman he committed adultery with. 
that's a beam and this other person had just a moat and then David said that man must die David but thou art the man then he began to pray yes we must pray clean up our lives live righteous and live holy before we can then come back into ministry and begin to teach other people in verse 7 put me with his soap and i shall be clean wash me and i shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness of the bones with thou hast broken me rejoice hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities creating me a clean heart to God renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence take not the Holy Spirit from me restore unto me the joy of thy salvation uphold me with thy free spirit look at verse 13 then you see that clean me up wash me restore me create in me a clean heart uphold me with your spirit then after my problem is solved after my heart is cleaned up after righteousness has come back into me then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee and the lord is telling us to balance everything up Make sure that the beam is out of your own eyes And then after that you'll be able to teach other people Isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah chapter 6 I'm going to read to you from verse 1 In the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne High and lifted up And his strength filled the temple Above it too the seraphim Sit one at six wings With twenty covered his face And with twenty covered his feet And with twenty did fly And one cried unto another And said holy, holy, holy Is the Lord of hosts The whole earth is full Of his glory And the post of the door Moved at the voice of him that cried And the house of fields Was smoked Then said I Woe is me This is Isaiah If you will look at Isaiah chapter 5 Look at Isaiah chapter 5 Verse 8 Woe to them that join House to house and then you look at verse 18 Warn to them that draw iniquity with the cuts of vanity Verse 20 Warn to them that call evil good and good evil Verse 21 Warn to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight 22 Warn to them that are mighty to drink wine And then it goes on and on Warn to them, warn to them And in the meantime there was something in his own life that's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, look at your own life. Examine your own self. And take the microscope or whatever it is and look at everything that you have there in your life and settle it at Calvary before you can be telling other people, warn to you and warn to you. It's good to be strong in preaching. You should be stronger in self-examination and personal cleansing of your own personal sin. Now in Isaiah chapter 6, here in verse 5, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean leaves. How wonderful it came to the realization before it became too late. And I dwell in the midst of a people of uncleanness, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, behold this, has touched thy leaves, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. After the sin had been purged, after his iniquity had been taken away, after the beam had been taken away from his heart, then he heard the 
voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He wants us to say, serve the Lord. It's not saying we will not serve the Lord. Yes, we're going to serve the Lord. But then let's make sure we clear all the things that are wrong in our own lives. To remove the mold from our brother's eye demands care. We must see clearly before this can be done properly without hurting our brother. Removing molds from the eyes of the brethren is a ministry that requires that our hands be clean and our hearts be pure. If we're going to help other people to have the molds out of their eyes removed, then our hands will be clean. How do you just you know, stick your hand into somebody's eye? Dirty hand. You're going to make his vision worse than it was before. Clean it up. And then make sure that you have a pure heart, a pure intention. Can a person be a good optician if he himself has very poor sight of vision? To help improve the spiritual sight of others, we must first cast the beam out of our own eye. No one is qualified to counsel or to correct others while he himself is indulging in sins that are known to God. His preaching, his teaching, his counseling or ministry will be done in the flesh. God will not give him necessary insight or understanding. His messages will be mere letters that kill. His so-called ministry will not lead the brethren to see more of Christ. Neither will he be able to lead sinners to see Christ as their savior. With a critical spirit, he criticizes, he condemns and will not be able to combat sinners or comfort the saints. Let us stop and consider our own spiritual state and spiritual standing. The urgent need for each of us is self-examination. You should be examining yourself. Are there beams of spiritual sin to be removed first? Check up. Are there beams of besetting sin to be cast out? Check up. Is there a root of bitterness to be removed first before it spreads its tentacles that could destroy us? Check up. Are there beams of offenses visible to all around us which make others resist or reject our ministry? Find out. Upon what grounds do you set up yourself as a teacher, as a reformer of the brethren, as a purifier of the church when you are even worse than those who are trying to teach or admonish? The wisest thing to do is to first seek total restoration from God. Be righteous and be right with God before attempting to lead others to righteousness. We'll come to point number three. Proper remedy for transforming the believers. The proper remedy for transforming the believers. We'll come to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 5, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine eye, then and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Cleanse yourself first. And make sure that your own life is clean. When your life is clean, you'll be in the best position to help your brother, your sister. Malachi chapter 2 verse 5. Malachi chapter 2 verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear where we he feared me. I know that he fears me, he honors me, is loyal to me, is faithful to me. Because of that, I gave him my commandments. I gave him my statutes. I gave him a ministry. You see how the Lord does it? He wants us to just cleanse our lives. It's not condemning us. It's not sending us to hell. Even though there's a beam, there's this, you remove that. It can be removed. Settle that. It can be settled. And take care of that in your personal life. It can be taken care of. And then he says, after you have taken it away, I forgive you and I forget. 
and it's not going to reject us and it's not going to say there's no ministry anymore there's still ministry it's not going to say we cannot help other people and cannot counsel other people yes we can help we will help but the only thing is take care of this first but you know some people they will not take care of that beam they say all the same i have a calling upon my life yes we know you have a calling upon your life i know that this is my gift and this is my talent if i don't do it i will not be happy yes we know but take away the beam but you know some people they're not taking away the beam out of their eyes and they're just busy emphasizing the gifts they have and the ministry they are called into you're not going to be useful in that ministry until you take the beam away from your eyes that's what the lord is saying the lord is eager to use you eager to make use of your talent and your gift but the first thing first and then it says in verse 5, the latter part, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves. That is, no iniquity, no beam. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's leaves shall keep knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. The Lord is saying we should do the right thing. Come to the Lord and take all the beams away. And then you'll be able to see clearly how you'll be able to help your brother, your sister, members of the church, or even leaders in the church too. We're told in Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1, Galatians chapter 6, brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, not, which are, not ye which are carnal, not ye which are worldly, not ye which have beams of offenses in your own eyes, but ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. You know, even after the beam is taken away from your eye and you want to help the other person, don't you understand? The eye is the most delicate organ in the body. And because it is so delicate in trying to remove the moat out of your brother's eye, you have to be very careful. And you have to be very much loving. And you have to show affection. It is not just let me remove the moat out of your eyes and then we'll pull it away and hurt him. You can even make him blind. You have to be very tender and very, very careful. The Lord does not permit us to be complacent, to retain the beams in our own eyes and then use that as an excuse for not helping others to be free from the moats in their eyes. Yes, we know that. It commands that we quickly and all gently as a matter of priority cast the moats out of our own eyes as soon as we are cleansed from our own secret faults. Having laid aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and we're made free from sin and made righteous by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb by faith in Christ's atoning blood, then we are ready and willing to help and improve the spiritual life of the brethren. And those who desire the office of a bishop, the office of an overseer, the office of a pastor, the office of a preacher must be blameless. Otherwise, you'll not be able to correct other people. He has a blemish in his life. Don't touch him. You can't rebuke another person if you are not blameless yourself. He drove away his wife. He must be disciplined. Yes, we understand. Who is to discipline him? It's your wife. It's you. You cannot keep your own sin and then try to challenge and discipline other people. It's always late to the workers' meeting. You cannot be a worker again. Yes, we understand. Who is to kind of exercise that discipline? Not you. If you're always late yourself. He's not zealous. He's not committed. 
I remember the olden days in our church. You know, we do evangelism. We come to night vigil. He doesn't come to night vigil. He doesn't do evangelism. We stop him. Yes, I understand. Who is to stop him? You cannot stop him. If you yourself, you never come to the night vigil. And you never do evangelism yourself. Take away the beam out of your eye. And then after that, you'll be able to take away the moat in the other person's eye. That's what the Lord is telling us. You know, discipline is not just something you just wake up and say, I have authority and I have power. And if you don't shape up, I will discipline you. You must shape up first before you discipline the rest of us. That's what the Lord is saying. We don't have any right. To say that we discipline another person or to say that we're taking the moat out of their eyes when the beam is in our own eyes. You know, uh, you are reported that, you know, you are not having good attitude to this other person. You must be disciplined. Yes, I understand. But the person to discipline must not have bitterness and hatred and anger. And visible act of violence in his own life. That's what the Lord is telling us. Remove the beam out of your own eyes, then will you see clearly to help the other person. And of course, of course, of course, those who are living in sin cannot rejoice and say, praise the Lord. There is no discipline anymore. There is discipline. Who tells you there is no discipline? Once the people remove the beams in their own eyes, they come back to you and they challenge you and rebuke you and reprove you. And even if they don't, and they are not able to rebuke you, they who disciplined Pharaoh in the Red Sea, Almighty God, who disciplined Nebuchadnezzar, and then he was turned to an animal and went to the forest for seven seasons, that's the Almighty God. Who disciplined Ananas and Sapphira, and they became dead, it wasn't Peter, it was the Almighty Almighty God Himself, and then Sina Kerub and all this army of 185,000 who disciplined them, it was the Almighty God. I about Achan, it was the Almighty God that revealed it, and then he was disciplined. And then, how about Samson? It wasn't any other person, it was his own sin. The cord of his sin bound him, and then he lost his eyes and he lost his power. Even if a man is not able to discipline you, God is there to discipline you as for discipline is always there and it is done by leader or done by God discipline will always be there but if a man is going to do it he must remove the beam out of his own eye and then he'll be able to see clearly to remove the moat out of another person's eye we must not tolerate or excuse imperfection in our own lives if we desire perfection in the lives of other people Indeed, all of us, sons of God, children of us, servants of God, we must be blameless and harmless without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Only then can we hold forth the word of life, bringing sinners to Christ and leading believers to greater experiences in Christ. What the Bible is saying, what the Lord is teaching us is this, we need holiness of heart. Practical righteousness, purity of intention, which will make us all some useful, profitable instruments in the hands of the Almighty God. However, we must always remember that removing a moat, a tiny particle from another person's eye, is not a task which can be done by any careless son. We need training and skill. If we would make, if not, if we not make bad matters worse, the eye is the most sensitive organ, the most delicate organ of the body, and the most easily damaged. A gentle hand, a well-trained hand, is required to extract a foreign substance from it. The person from whose eye the splinter is to be removed must be willing for you to do it. If, if you want to remove a mold from another person's eyes, the other fellow must be willing. 
The other fellow must be steady, must open his eyes, and then it's okay. I want you to help me remove it. I know you. You are sincere. You, you have affection. You love me. And you want the best for me. I've been waiting for somebody like you. You know, come and remove it for me. They have to be willing before you can do it effectively. And then, if you want to perform operation, it's your wisdom that makes the other fellow willing to allow you to extract the most. It's your love that acts as the local anesthetic that minimizes the pain of the operation. When the doctor wants to perform an operation, he wants you not to feel the pain. There is a local anesthetic that they use so as to deaden that place, not to have the feeling of pain. And it is your love that acts as that local anesthetic. And then you're able to help them and remove the moat out of their own eyes. And then they become better in life. You are better. They are better. The whole church becomes better. And if Jesus comes, you will go to heaven and your people will go to heaven. Give me a good amen. amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help us. God will help you and God will help me. That will not be judging other people, condemning other people, criticizing other people. We don't need criticism. We need correction, but not criticism. Don't criticize other people. Love them. If you love one another, then we'll be able to help one another. And then check up your own life. Check up your own life. The beam in your own eye. Are, are you thinking about that? Your own shortcoming? Think about that. Your own weakness, think about that. Your own lack of spirituality, think about that. Your own carelessness, think about that. Your own carnality, think about that. Your own worldliness, think about that. Your own flippancy in talking, think about that. Your own tail bearing, gossip, malice, malice, malicious kind of a relationship, think about that. Your own laziness, procrastination, think about that. Your own wrong attitude, negative attitude to people, think about that. Correct yourself first. You know, if you just try to correct other people, make other people shape up and do this so that they can run faster and make progress and climb higher and become more spiritual, that's a good intention. That's a good intention. But clean up your own life first. Check up your cell. Check up your cell. And don't allow the study to just be like all the studies you have come to before. And then there is no change. There is no transformation. And then you disqualify yourself for further ministry. Because it is when you remove the beam out of your eye, you'll be able to see clearly and the Lord will give you more open doors to be able to go on in ministry helping other people. Remove the beam in your eyes. If you're always complaining, can you, can you correct other people who are murmuring? If you're prayerless, can you try to help other people to be more prayerful? If you never study the Bible for yourself, can you criticize or correct other people who are not able to read memory verse on Sunday? If your life is not spiritual, can you, can you point an accusing finger to another person? His carnal is worldly. If you ever sleep and overeat, can you point to, you know, those who are out of shape and say, look at these people, they eat too much and they sleep too much. Why don't you cast out the beam out of your eyes before you can help other people to cast out the most in their own eyes? And if you are not dedicated in the work of God, 
serious in the work of God, committed in the work of God, doing the very best you can for the progress of the kingdom. Can you point a cursing finger to other people and say, look at that careless sin that they did. Look at that careless sin that so and so did. How can you do that? You must take it with a beam out of your own eyes before you can correct other people to take the moat out of their own eyes. If you have been coming to the church for such a long time, and then the word of God never penetrates, never changes you, never pierces you, never makes any change in your life. Can you talk about other people who have been coming to church? See them. They are coming to church. They are not born again. Do you have any mouth to talk? The beam must be out of your eye before you can correct other people to take the moat out of their own eyes. If you are not sanctified and purified in your heart, pure motive, pure intention, pure eternal life, pure heart, rapturable heart, if you don't have that, can you complain about other people? They are worldly. Look at them. Look at their dressing. You can talk. There's a beam in your own eye. Remove the beam in your eye and then will you see clearly. Then you'll be able to go to them in love, with affection, with wisdom. To help them remove the moat, the splinter, the little particle, the little foreign object in your own eyes. And they're not going to listen to you if you don't show love. And nobody is going to allow you to touch their eyes and remove the splinter. If you don't have wisdom, if you don't show that you love the person you're trying to correct, you know, they're not going to accept. All that kind of ministry, you'll be, it will be a waste of your time, a waste of your resources, a waste of your life. Just trying to correct people when you don't love them. When you don't have affection for them. And when there's a lot of beams shooting out of your own eyes. Nobody is going to listen to you. You'll be frustrated. Because you do that and do that and do that. And the fellow knows you just have a selfish ambition. Wanting to control him. Wanting to be a master over another person when in your own life you are not in control of your life you don't set your house in order and you are not a master of your own life take out the beams make sure there is salvation there return to me the joy of your salvation Make sure that the Lord knows He has sanctified you, has purified you. He has taken that Adamic nature, the root of sin. He has taken that away. That big beam of timber, very heavy. You cast that away. And then you come under the dreams of the flowing blood of the Lamb. The fountain. Of the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from all sin, from all iniquity. You allow the flowing blood of Jesus Christ to make that total change, cleansing, purification. Then, you come out of that experience more loving, more pure, more righteous and more holy. Then, in tenderly, you'll be able to minister to other people and remove the modes, the faults. In their lives, you'll be able to help them. Yes, you'll help other people, but help yourself first. Help yourself first. Clear up your vision first. Take the beam away first. Correct your faults first. Get rid of that sin first. Get rid of the hatred and the bitterness first. Get rid of the malice and the wrong intention first. Take it with the beam of carnal, sinful, worldly lifestyle first. 
appear be holy without blemish or spot be blameless then will you be able to see clearly to remove the moat the shortcoming the offense from the lives of other people seek the lord get better deeper in the lord richer in christian experiences